You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from theheart.org on Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the Heart.org Medscape Cardiology. And this is This Week in Cardiology for July 24th, 2020. This week... COVID, note on vaccines, defibrillators, watchmen, and two excellent features. First, let me apologize for my voice. I have an upper respiratory infection. It's viral and caused a fever, but fortunately, it is not COVID. The short story on COVID update is that America remains in a hot mess. Yesterday, we hit 4 million, 4 million cases. Of course, hospitalizations are increasing, and early data looks like deaths in certain hotspots are tracking up. A week ago, U.S. deaths were 141,000, and now they are 147, so the rate of rise of 1.04x is steady. But again, the flat line belies the focal nature of this pandemic, and the same hotspots remain. Still, though, in terms of COVID deaths per million in each state, The current hotspots remain many-fold lower than New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Internationally, Brazil, Mexico, India continue to report increasing cases and deaths. I wanted to do a little note on vaccines and T-cells because, of course, this is the way out of this problem. And I've read this week that numerous studies on multiple vaccines are out. Just a brief comment. First is the Moderna messenger RNA virus, and this was published in New England Journal on July 14th, a phase one dose escalation study in 45 adults that did induce anti-SARS-CoV-2 immune responses in all participants and no trial limiting safety concerns were identified. Another one is a Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. And again, I'll link to a preprint, but this is a follow-up study on a previous phase one study of this messenger RNA that encodes the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. Again, no severe side effects, though most patients who had the vaccine reported fever, fatigue, and headache. Derek Lowe from Science Magazine wrote that those who are vaccinated against coronavirus will know they had a vaccine. This study had encouraging results. First, neutralizing antibody response from the vaccine can handle a wide range of mutations in the spike protein and it's in its receptor binding domain. That's important. There was also a robust CD8 T cell response in 29 of 36 patients that did not necessarily correlate with antibody titers raised by the vaccine. Now this differs a bit from Moderna's messenger RNA response, which induced mostly CD4 cells. There was also an Oxford vaccine published in Lancet. This was a chimpanzee adenovirus vectored vaccine expresses the coronavirus spike protein. And again, these were healthy adults in phase one and phase two studies. And they too saw low side effects in both humoral and T cell responses and conclude that their data suggests large scale evaluation of this vaccine in ongoing phase three studies. Finally, there's the CanSino vaccine. Again, in the Lancet, Chinese investigators did a phase two RCT of another adenovirus type 5 vectored vaccine. As it's phase 2, they looked at two doses in about 500 patients. Both doses induced neutralizing antibodies and T cell responses, again with minimal side effects. But the main limitation here seemed that people who had existing levels of antibodies to the adenovirus vector had diminished immune responses. Now, the authors tell us that in Chinese populations, about half of the population is in that category. In India, it's 80%. In the U.S., around 30%. Of note, this is a one-shot vaccine. The other story on vaccines this week is that the Pfizer CEO gave an interview to Time magazine. said they are spending $2 billion on the vaccine program, and there are plans to have 100 million doses by year's end. 
Now, he said from a return on investment standpoint, they would never do this in normal times. It's just too early in the drug development. They aim to charge governments a nominal fee for the vaccine so that it can be given free to citizens. You know, I've been tough on pharma in past podcasts, but here we really need pharma to come through for us. Finally, before I go to cardiology, another brief note on T-cells and a really remarkable paper from Nature. This paper looked at memory T-cells in 36 recovered COVID-19 patients. In all of them, they demonstrated the presence of CD4 and CD8 T-cells that recognizes multiple regions of the NP protein. Surprisingly, they also frequently detected SARS-CoV-2-specific T-cells in people with no history of SARS, COVID-19, or any contact with SARS or COVID-19 patients, so about 37 patients. Now pause there for a minute. That is kind of wild. The T cells here are recognizing particular protein regions that have low homology to those found in the common cold viruses, but do have a high homology to various other animal coronaviruses. This T cell data are important because you know those studies that say antibody prevalence in a community is low, so exposure has been low and the susceptibility is high. Well, maybe humoral antibodies are only part of the story when it comes to immunity for SARS-CoV-2. All right, now some cardiology. There's a really important paper on ICD effects over the long term. Professor Jeannie Poole from the University of Washington, along with other investigators of the landmark scud Heft trial, have published an intriguing, highly relevant, but imperfect post hoc analysis of the landmark scud Heft. Jack published this long-term follow-up paper, and Dr. Eric Stecker from Oregon co-authored a worthy editorial. Definitely take a look at this. Recall that Scud Heft, published in 2005 in New England, was one of the landmark trials that established ICD benefit in patients with heart failure. It was a three-arm RCT of ICD, amio, and placebo. Half of the patients had ischemic cardiomyopathy, and the other half had non-ischemics. Now, in this study of very young, about age 60, mostly male patients, about 2,500 total, ICDs were shown to reduce overall mortality by a whopping 7% in absolute terms. It's an NNT of about 14. SCUDHEF was about four years in duration, and there were also two interesting pre-specified subgroup findings. One was that while class 2 patients enjoyed a huge 46% reduction of death from the ICD, those with class 3 heart failure got no benefit. In fact, the point estimate here of the hazard ratio was 1.16. Again, this was a pre-specified endpoint. The second pre-specified subgroup finding was that while both non-ischemic and ischemic patients had similar hazard ratios for ICD benefit, about a 25% reduction, The smaller number of events in the non-ischemic arm did not meet statistical significance. Now, these two findings were largely ignored at the time an ICD implantation went on in earnest in patients with heart failure who met ejection fraction criteria. I call this the period of irrational exuberance. Companies held weekend training courses to get non-electrophysiologists, interventional cardiologists up to speed. But today, one of the most pressing questions in all of everyday electrophysiology is what to do with patients with heart failure who have an ICD and they present with battery depletion, say, 8 to 10 years after the initial implant. Dr. Poole's analysis of the long-term results of SCUD have informed that decision, as well as shedding light on the original findings from the main trial and also sheds light on the equally landmark Danish trial which showed no benefit for the ICD in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Here is what Dr. Poole's group did. They had mortality outcomes for about 1,800 patients who were alive at the end of the main trial in 2010 and 2011. This was about five years after the 2005 publication. These data were then combined with the 660 deaths from the main trial in an effort to compare long-term outcomes overall and for the two subgroups I mentioned. And the result summary is this. The median follow-up was 11 years. Now remember that these patients in their late 50s and early 60s were young, so 11-year follow-up is highly relevant. The good news is that overall ICD benefit held up, though the hazard ratio dropped 
to about 0.87 or a 13% reduction, with the confidence intervals ranging from a 24% benefit to only a 2% benefit. But it still was statistically significant. The subgroup findings were also upheld and strengthened in the long-term follow-up. For ischemic heart failure, the hazard ratio was highly significant at 0.81 or 19% benefit, but the hazard ratio for non-ischemics was a non-significant 0.97. And for heart failure class, the hazard ratio was a highly significant 24% reduction for those patients who had class 2 heart failure and a definitively non-significant 1.06 for those in class 3 heart failure. So putting this in context, in 2008, a landmark paper, one that I think is the pinnacle of critical appraisal possibly ever, Rod Tong, Peter Zimmetbaum, and the late Mark Josephson exactly predicted these results and also the Danish results. Now, I'll link to that paper. The thing about ICD's benefit is it has a classic notch. You have to be healthy enough so that the arrhythmic risk is your main threat, but not so sick that advanced heart failure or other non-cardiac causes of death dominate. Hence, the sustained benefit in class 2 patients, it makes perfect sense plausibility-wise that patients with advanced forms of heart failure will not benefit from protection against only arrhythmic death. Now, Tung, Zimitbaum, and Josephson also warned about the diminished benefit in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And this long-term analysis confirms the many, many, many signals from the days of old that patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy stand to benefit less or none from an ICD. For instance, SCUDHEF was a large trial of more than 2,000 patients and a high death rate, and the hazard ratio for non-ischemics did not meet significance. You also had definite. This was a study of super high-risk patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And again, ICD benefit did not reach significance. And then Danish confirmed these findings clearly not reaching statistical significance. I would also refrain from saying that all Kaplan-Meier curves come together eventually, which is completely true because we all die. But these are 60-year-old patients and 10-year data is highly relevant. Now the caveats. There are caveats. The two most important caveats of this paper, which the authors clearly state, are the loss to follow-up and that after the main trial, many patients crossed over to an ICD. The loss to follow-up is expected as the trial had closed. The crossover is also expected because when the trial ended, patients in the placebo arm were offered ICDs. Now this obviously decreases the ICD benefit. But still, the non-ischemic chromopathy versus ischemic chromopathy comparison is upheld, as was the class 2 versus class 3. This gets me thinking that I think the biggest need for trial in all of electrophysiology is an ICD trial at the time of gen change. One group gets left alone, and they incur no risk of infection, hematoma, inappropriate shocks, lead failures, and the other group gets ICD changes. These would be Older patients than in have, of course. My guess is that avoiding gen changes would fare better than you think. Next topic is Watchman. Now, FDA this week approved the Watchman Flex device for left atrial appendage occlusion. Now, you expect this with devices. Over time, there are iterations and iterative improvements, and multiple colleagues tell me that this iteration is an advance. The FDA approval was based on a 12-month industry-sponsored single-arm study of, of about 400 patients. The study met its safety endpoint with a low incidence of complications, around 0.5%, and impressively, a 100% rate of left atrial appendage closure at 12 months. This included no leaks greater than 5 millimeters. About 96% of the patients were able to discontinue oral anticoagulation following their 45-day follow-up. Now, the caveats are that this is an unpublished report. It was presented at Heart Rhythm. There's no control arm, no outcomes. My view of the data from Prevail and Protect and the pathophysiology of stroke in patients with AF and the safety profile of DOEX relative to both aspirin and warfarin means that we need outcomes data with these new devices. Yes, it is true. You may be able to better close the appendage, with better devices, but that still does not mean that a focal solution to the systemic disease of stroke 
will provide a net benefit. What is more, I challenge you to go over to the virtual HRS website and peruse the Watchman studies. It's kind of surprising. There were a number of concerning studies. There's a Mass General Group has a poster on rates of complications reported in MAUD. And Christopher Ellis himself from Vanderbilt, a proponent of Watchman, has a poster on three patients with devices that had failed to endothelialize at autopsy. Of course, that's relevant because if it doesn't endothelialize, that would explain the higher ischemic rates of stroke in the Watchman arm of the warfarin trials. Um, make no mistake, I'm not saying that these imperfect abstracts prove that the procedure does not work. It's just that the existing RCD data is so dubious, and the patients being done now were excluded from these trials. We just don't know. In conclusion, I want to point out two excellent features on Medscape that are worth your time. One is a podcast interview that Drs. Eric Tobel and Abraham Verghese did with Dr. Anthony Fauci. This is a really good interview. Dr. Fauci is just such an impressive person. The second is a surprise column from my colleague, Dr. Melissa Walton Shirley, in which she defends the controversial Dr. Sandeep Johar and his editorial in the New York Times. Now, Dr. Johar encountered some serious vitriol online when he dared suggest that perhaps Americans don't require the volume of care that their doctors are used to providing. I totally agree with that statement, but I was also pleasantly surprised to read that Melissa Walton Shirley was as well. Take a look at her column. As always, it's well-written and it's worth your time. So that's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you. And remember, if you like this podcast, it means so much if you could give us a rating or a review or talk to your friends so that others can find us. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org on Medscape.